and this I did it in five seconds. I don't even manage his skill. So he's been working on this. So he's like really uh, trying to convert all these data to standardized formats, but he's doing it in a programmatic way. Manage your job is safe. <laughs> so this is something that I did for the data. The funny thing is that it can also be like indexes for reference values. So what is normal and what is not. And then let's go for imaging right now. So we kind of stopped here, but I can force it to the same all. And now I actually post my actual MRI result, which I have for a unlimited disk. And I said, can you integrate both of them? And I want a single JSON file. And it's in German. I mean, I, 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 I saw it when it comes to German. I asked him to translate it to English and he did it for me. So what it does is very interesting. At first it starts bundling the block results. So that's what you see right now. It actually went through the whole thing. It's a long JSON file, but that's not how it happened. So you just finish it. And at the end, it start including the MR report. And if you look at the second part, it has particular keywords, which should again take me quite a bit of time, because if you look at the type from MR standards, that's a hardly maintained page with a lot of information. But now it's super easy. So you look at it, it says it's just like the diagnostic report, system, blah, 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 code is served just by MR. These are all standardized words. The moment things are standardized, programmers can do a lot of things. So we can actually index it, we can retrieve it, we can start making a ta tabular Excel sheet. And once everything comes to the tabular Excel sheet format, you can do whatever. And this is how it usually works. So, I hope I convinced you that uh, you don't need to break a bank to con convert everything to FHIR. If you just need to have a lot of discipline to show which data or which information you want to export from your scene. So as you are from genomics, you are from wearables, or you are from imaging, think about what information is the most useful one and just export it to a bundle. And don't export everything because it's not that useful. If you think it's not useful. And the other thing that I really like is, is that it doesn't only speak the language of the computer, it also speak the language of humans. The other problem that we have right now is that different CEOs have different grammar and languages. But I would like to understand what a wearable person says or we are looking at VO2 max and this is kind of impacting that and the genomics person says you have this KRAS gene which is kind of weird. I don't understand that. I want to play in this and you can actually force again a large language model to say here is my report, can you make it in plain English? And this is also normal. So for example, I do this with my, all my German contracts, my German um, MR reports. So this is kind of interesting because it helps us to talk in a plain way so that we understand what the other person is saying. It's like a universal adapter. And I want to highlight certain success stories of integrating data. So how many of you know HUS? So HUS is, is a university hospital in Helsinki and they have created something called the Data Lake. They have been digital from day one and what, what they have done is that they have integrated all the data of the patients and create a centralized repository that any of the researchers or the doctors can have a look into. And they have such rich longitudinal data. And when I say about this, they have almost everything when, when a person comes into the hospital. And what is interesting about this is that the first use case that they try to do is in the case of pediatrics. So what they wanted to find if a particular baby is born with a low sepsis. And based on the longitudinal data that they had, they were able to predict 48 hours before if a certain person, like a baby, is going to go into sepsis and they start deciding the treatment plan. And this is done by nurses. And this is a huge success. You don't need to bother the overworked doctor, you kind of know what is going on, then you have an alarm system that helps. And this is one of the things that is quite um, big in Helsinki and, and Scandinavia is kind of leading the whole thing, and you can also find similar efforts in this field. The other thing that I want to again emphasize is that the whole data lake was not created by the university. It was created by, uh, in collaboration with a private company because they can allow to scale 
deep down, because we can't deal with it that we have to deal with. So this is something that we would, I would like to strongly emphasize. And things are getting into commercial realms as well. So do you guys know Epic? Epic is a ESR company which is quite famous in the US. And now Apple already has these external files. Oh, this is coming. So I used to have an Apple before. <laughs> So Apple will have these external files. So now they want to create a Mac app which gives you like an overview of the status, and you can just transmit your variable data, your hard drive, <coughs> your medication thing. Apple has a very good summary on what they do. So they're creating an app where you can you have control over your own healthcare records, which is pretty powerful. So coming to the next thing, assume that you did the job of getting a JSON file. Unifying everything, creating a feature matrix. A feature matrix is a fancy word for an Excel sheet. So once you have this Excel sheet, you need to have a strong enough complete structure because now we are talking about not static data, but we are talking about longitudinal data over a bunch of time. So again, we need some strong computer infrastructure. And I have the experience of convincing, convincing here in, in our department that we should get a server. But you need to choose your own Ikigai based on where you want. If you are in Europe, forget about cloud computing unless you are in MLS. But if you are like the US, they are moving towards AWS and Azure, you just need to choose what works for you. Our recommendation is go for something cloud because they can scale quite well rather than how we move. So for example, NVIDIA has local stuff like DGX, and then we have Azure, we have Google Cloud, and we have AWS. Usually people use a mixture of this. Just calculate that if you want to perform any kind of whole person research, you should actually be AI ready because you need to integrate the data, make sense of all of it, gain some insights, and at one point start having interventions. So this is something that has been started by NVIDIA. NVIDIA Clara is a pretty much like a software platform. You can think of it like an AI factory. It works if they have built tools for genomics. They have built tools for imaging, they have built tools for anything you can think of. The only thing that you need to do is buy a 200,000 DGA spawn. Once you get that, you have incredible customer service. Uh, I can recommend it. And the second one is AWS. This is something that is very interesting because I thought, okay, why would people work with AWS and all of them? I mean, this is Amazon and why would people upload their data and blah, 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 blah. And then I looked at the grand challenge. Uh, so, a grand challenge is a place where you can put up some kind of channels like segmenting tumors or segmenting anything or it can be like looking for a particular way. They have posted an amazing website where you don't need to worry about anything. You just upload your algorithm, they benchmark you and they tell you how good you are. So, all these things, universities will not be able to do because the reward system in the university is very different. Because, I mean, if I ask the postdocs or the PhDs, how about we set up Docker today? I can, I can vouch for Zach. It's like the worst thing you can do for yourself. Because that's not something that you want to do. It's an engineering problem. There is no reward in academia for doing it. But if you go to an AWS person and say, that, okay, can you do this for me? They do this because that's a better than that. I think we should also think that we can't do it. And the final one, so assume you have the feature vectors now and you have also say, okay, now I'm going to create the model and you think your job is done, that's not true. That's why your job actually starts if you want to deploy a model that is going to be used in claims. So creating a module is the easiest part. Even if you're not an AI expert, now there are tools that can actually help you to build incredibly AI models. I mean, it will not be the best, but you can get by. So this is the open source tools that are available. You have an incredible ecosystem, and most of them are developed by industries. So if you take PyTorch, it's developed by Meta. If you take Enterflow, it's developed by Google. Moma I have, which is by NVIDIA. Final Place is recently acquired by IBM. The reason why I say that we should stand on shoulders of giants is that we don't need to worry about maintenance or bugging issues. Because when I say something is not working, I write them a text, and I get response within a day. This would never happen with another case. They'll be like, it sounds like a new problem, not a new problem. I mean, it's fair. It's, we don't have that for like maintenance and stuff. It's kind of our research. It works on our computer. We publish our reward system says well done. But this is kind of different because these companies need to maintain this ecosystem because they need to have the internet button. So that's 
So this is something interesting. So creating a module is the easiest part, and then comes the annoying part, which is ML ops, or which is a fancy word of saying DevOps. It starts with the design. First, you need to think if you are answering a valuable question by doing whole person research, like what is your target. And once you start doing that, you start to developing the model, you kind of go with the engineering engine, you make the model development, and the third part of the operations, you deploy it, you clean it, and watch it crash and burn. Because the first, it will work really well on your data set. The moment you start going away from your data set, you can actually see it drift in the performance. It's a nice curve, which totally demoralizes you. But you need to look, at, look it up and say, okay, these are the places where it actually perform in the house. I need to include these data sets and make things better. Or you say, okay, this problem is really a hard problem to solve, not, not worth it because we don't have resources. But this kind of model deployment and monitoring for performance is really good. The reason why I showed you this Google, this, um, um, this diabetic retinopathy, is that they were the first to identify that they had to do this DevOps. In 2015, again, they saw that okay, we saw a drift in performance, and these are the things that you should look for. And they said, we do DevOps for regular business, but now we are doing it for machine learning, so we should look into this. And the last one, I know that recently everyone is going behind Trashworth the AI, but I am trying, I'm going to again convince you that it's not as shiny as it is. So for example, there are three kinds of trustworthiness, but which basically means can I interpret what this AI is saying? And there are three kinds of interpretability. Like an engineer's interpreter, interpretability, this is what me and Zan really care. Do we understand this? Then we have the causal interpretability, which means that, okay, does X cause Y? And then you have the trust and using interpretability, which is the AI explaining to us why we made a particular choice. The engineer's interpretability is very simple. You just want to see if the weights actually make sense so that it, can, it transforms input one to input two. Cost interpretability is very important when it comes to whole person research. Assume that the, the algorithm says everyone who is bald and brown is getting a cardiovascular event. It can be true, and the engineer's uh, interpretability says okay, the weights actually so, show a strong correlation between people who are brown and are bald, they all get a cardiovascular event. But we obviously know that's not the case. There should be something that is going inside that we don't know. So causal inter interpretability is very, very important. And we need to identify causality rather than correlations. And the third one is trust in using interpretability. You can actually, so for example, if you feed this to GPT and ask like, okay, can you prove me that bald people actually get tired of it? It's going to make up stuff. It's definitely going to make up stuff. But there is also a bias when something explains to us, we tend to trust it more. So we should, we should be able to find the same quality. It's like Manuel telling me that he's not stressed right now. It's, it's, I know that he's stressed, but it's, it's kind of like when people explain you some of the trust. So we should look at these factors. And these factors can only be proven by doing biological experiments. There is no way that you can actually just use AI and trust AI. AI has the most empathetic kind of in the set, but then you need to prove why it happens. So what next? Once you actually have the AI model, what should you do? At this point, when it comes to whole person research, you should empower the public. Put it in an app, like create a model, and say in our case, I mean, I put Zach because we actually talked a lot about this and I just wanted him to be famous today. <laughs> so, in this case, we have a particular model which, which says that, uh, we take a simple case. He has not been walking for a long time and he has been Instagramming and facing quite a lot. And his last blood panel was not that great, he should probably take off. And a mobile phone is the best thing that you can use to deploy this because you use it 24 7 and the thing monitors more than you think. It actually knows which route you take. And I sound like a standard situation, it's, it's, it's not, it's just that how it works. It can tell how much you have walked and it can tell if you are actually having high phone use or something. So based on this, the phone can show an indicator. Yeah, you just bumped up your heart risk by 10%. Now you are at 30% risk of getting a cardiovascular issue, and 20% of getting a urinary issue. That would freak him out. And if my phone said that, I would freak out. And uh, the thing is, the, the beauty of this whole thing of <coughs> is that unless you have accountability, there is no way you can improve the society. And I, like me and my
my father is a very good example because when, 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 when my father said that, um, uh, when the doctor actually said, okay, look, you have a higher risk of um, getting clogged arteries, my father did not believe it. He was like, ah, it's going to be fine. It will not happen to me, I'm special. And then they did the doctor. The moment he saw the doctor, the guy freaked out. Give me a that I think he got this on hot thing and now he's 60. The guy works for two, two hours every day. And this, I think, is a strong case of imaging. Because we are humans, we see, and we believe what we see. And I think imaging is going to be a wonderful thing uh, to get a comfortable So, okay, I hope you guys kind of get it and you probably might think, okay, now what? I just want you to, uh, want you to understand that only person basis is kind of expensive. Um, it's, it's not something simple that you can have like local plan because it's not, uh, it's a long event like that you have a lot of people if you want to actually build something that is useful for the general public and for the betterment of public health, this needs to be done in scale. And for that, there are three things that we need to do. The first one is a unified database, and I think this one is remarkably done in Europe right now because of the Zero in Health database. We are unifying the data and hopefully it gets done 